Hi, Hank. It's good to hear you. And I hope all the weather is going out there not too bad for you. And this has my question has to do with the weather because of uh, all the forest fires we've been happening. And California had horrible, horrible rampages of fire. British Columbia has 1.3 million acres that have been decimated in the last drought. Uh, it was about 10 or 11 weeks of virtually no rain. And if you could speak to the um, uh, part in Revelations where it says a third of the world would be burnt up by fire. Now, whether this is by nuclear warfare or whether it's by weather, I'd just like you to speak to that thing. And my prayers are with you, and hope that hopefully you will escape the perils of the hurricane that is going against your side of the world. Yeah, well, a couple of things I would say. The first thing I'd point out is that throughout the history of the world, there have been huge tragedies. If you think of the Black Death, for example, that uh, consumed a third of Europe, uh, that was uh, a, an absolutely horrific event. Uh, so there have always been tragedies. You think of what happened with Katrina. And, 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 and so in this world, we will have trouble. Take heart, said Jesus Christ. I've overcome the world. I think the mistake we make is that we think that what's going on in the book of Revelation has predominantly to do with our time. It does not. Uh, Revelation is predominantly focused on four future events. And, and let me give you an example of that. I think this is an example that's easy for people to remember. It takes place in, in Revelation chapter 6. This is about the sun, the moon, and the stars. So remember the Lamb opens the sixth seal, and there's a great earthquake. The sun turns black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turns blood red. Uh, the stars then fall from the sky. They fall to earth. Uh, I think the description that's given there is as late fig trees drop their figs when shaken by a strong wind. The, the sky recedes like a scroll and, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, the first thing we ought to note is that this is apocalyptic language. And we don't want to read it in a wooden literalistic fashion, but in the sense in which it is intended. And what is that sense? Well, we get the sense or we get the code for understanding what's going on with this apocalyptic language by reading the rest of the Bible. So John's words find a referent. They find that referent in words spoken by Jesus Christ. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ was seated on the Mount of Olives. And he was surrounded by his disciples. And he used the self-same imagery in describing what was coming with respect to the judgment of Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So John's words hearken back to the words of Jesus, but the words of Jesus also hearken back to something. And that is the words of Isaiah regarding what would take place when Babylon was judged. So here Jesus is hearkening back to words that related to something six centuries earlier. And probably everyone listening to my voice will remember those words where you have the Lord saying through Isaiah that his day was coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate, to destroy sinners within it. And then the words, the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will will not give its light. So what's going on here? In all three cases, the prophets are using apocalyptic language that's pointing to final future realities in order to judge, or, or, or to describe, I should say, judgment in their generation. 
And while the near future catastrophe, like the demolition of Babylon or the destruction of Jerusalem, fulfills the cosmic language, it doesn't exhaust the cosmic language. Because as Peter's apocalyptic prophecy of judgment on Jerusalem suggests, there will be a day when, when ultimate judgment looms on the horizon, when the heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire, when the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But says Peter, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, which is the home of righteousness. So while Peter's prophecy was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem, the events of AD 70 and the cosmic language that Peter used to describe them point forward to an even greater day of judgment when the problem of sin and Satan will be fully and finally resolved. In the new heavens, in the new earth, uh, those exemplified by the purified Lamb will no longer have need of the sun, moon, or stars, for there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp. They will not need the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So let me summarize that by simply saying that John, like Jesus... And Jesus, like the prophets, used the imagery of sun, moon, and stars in order to refer to the near future judgment of Jerusalem. And while the language finds ultimate fulfillment in the second coming of Jesus Christ, it is inaugurated in the Jewish Holocaust of AD 70. Uh, of course, to suppose that stars are, are literally going to fall to the earth is sheer nonsense. What one star alone would obliterate the earth, let alone a hundred billion stars. And in the same fashion, to recast the stars as meteors that uh, meteorites that are going to fall to the ground and hit hard as unripe things, like uh, the prophecy pundits do, uh, is interpretive suicide. There's there's no warrant for figuratively reinterpreting stars as meteors, and there there there, there should. Uh, never be an untethered sense from the pillar and post of Scripture. The code of Revelation is not broken uh, by, by unrestrained subjectivity. It's ultimately uh, broken through understanding the Scripture. So what have I just said? I've said what you have to do in all these cases is read Scripture in light of Scripture. So if you want to understand what's going on in Revelation chapter 6, well, understand what's going on in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. And understand that Jesus' language, which John borrows in Revelation, is the same language that is used by Isaiah. So Jesus, the heir to the linguistic riches of the Old Testament prophets, and a far greater prophet than them all, is using the language of the prophets in the same way. Isaiah is using the language with respect to the destruction of Babylon, Jesus is using the language with respect to what is going to happen when Jerusalem is destroyed. So again, what is important is reading Scripture in light of Scripture. 